I think I'm too oblivious to solve any crimes, to be honest, but that's a different story for these people. I'm your host Yusuf, and these are 10 scary crimes solved by normal people. Make sure to subscribe and ring that bell to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Anyways, let's stay attentive. Number 10, Carl Koppelman. The man known as Carl Koppelman is an extraordinary artist. Koppelman's work as an amateur sketch artist began in 2009 when he noted that police reconstructions of unidentified and formerly unidentified dissidents often did not resemble their subjects, as well as looking stiff and not lively. Koppelman's first reconstruction was of a male found passed away of accidental causes in a motel in Philadelphia in 2006, later identified as Joseph Cole. After this, Koppelman continued to create reconstructions. Initially, Koppelman would do reconstructions based on which cases had had post-mortem photos publicly available online. Though as he grew in rapport, Koppelman began to work with law enforcement on cases. Nancy Monahan's website for missing and unidentified people in Pennsylvania asked to use one of Koppelman's reconstructions, this one being of an unidentified male who passed in a hospital in Los Angeles after a coma, caused by blunt trauma to the head, who was later identified as George Pollard of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Koppelman's reconstruction was directly attributed to helping match the identification as loved ones of Pollard saw the reconstruction on Monahan's website and noted the similarities between the reconstruction and George Pollard. Pollard's case is often attributed to be Koppelman's first significant contribution as a forensic artist. Since he began his forensic involvement, Koppelman has helped to close eight cases as of 2019. Koppelman has no specific criteria for how he picks which cases he will reconstruct. Koppelman's renderings themselves have been credited in the identifications of three unidentified dissidents. Koppelman himself has matched five identities, and his contributions have helped two people, missing, presumed gone, be recovered alive. Koppelman, who is almost always an unpaid volunteer, puts every reconstruction up on a website called Web Sleuths. Koppelman also sends his completed reconstructions to Nam Us, who then decide whether or not to display it on the case's listing. Koppelman also works by request with local law enforcement and is a volunteer at the DNA DOE project, where he helps to do genealogical research in addition to providing reconstructions. In addition to reconstructions of unidentified descendants, Koppelman also gets requests from families of missing persons to create age progressions of their missing loved ones. Koppelman receives a high volume of such requests and is not logistically capable of fulfilling all of them. Koppelman's web slew's involvement in multiple cases have been reported in the press, most famously those of Tammy Alexander and Sherry Jarvis. One of the owners of Web Slews, Trisha Griffith, has personally thanked Koppelman for his contributions. Following the passing of his mother in 2017, Koppelman returned to work as an accountant, but continues to create forensic reconstructions. Number 9. Web Sleuths Web Sleuths is an internet community that is focused on crime and missing persons. The privately owned Web Sleuths LLC maintains a forum for registered users to discuss and classify information related to crimes, trials, and unsolved cases which they are trying to solve. Trisha Griffith purchased the site in 2004. Some content is available for viewing without registration, but members have an option to be verified with their credentials with the administrator if they have a specific expertise, such as DNA analysis professionals, law enforcement, or are related to a specific crime in some way. Crimes which have received national attention are always highlighted by web sleuths. The 2008 Kaylee Anthony execution and 2011 trial of her mother drew years of interest and commentary regarding the execution, media attention to the case, and documentation of evidence and information. The television show Law & Order portrayed web sleuths in an episode about the Anthony case named Crime Busters. Number 8. Ellen Leach From her desk in Orange Grove, Ellen Leach helped identify a skull found in a bucket of cement at a Missouri truck stop. From Leach's 2005 findings, the skull was found to be that of Iowa antiques dealer Gregory May. May's remains were identified two days before his roommate, Douglas De Bruyne, went to trial for May's termination. Leach said De Bruyne and his girlfriend were caught selling May's antique collection in Arizona. It would have been the first case in Iowa to go to trial without a body, Leach said. Since 2005, Leach has helped solve eight cases around the country. That's kind of unheard of in the web sleuth community, said Deborah Halber, 
author of The Skeleton Crew, each chapter of which highlights a web sleuth who has helped solve cold cases across the nation. Leach's story, The Head in the Bucket, is chapter 12. This ID came through just in the nick of time to get the guy convicted, Halber said. Halber, a Boston resident, came to Gulfport to meet Leach after learning of her success in the web sleuth community. She said Leach is a part of a minority of people who are actually spending the time trying to identify the missing with unidentified remains. Leach moved to Gulfport in 2001, and that's when she began researching missing and unidentified websites and databases, trying to find matches. In 1995, two of Leach's younger cousins went missing, and it was later learned the boys' mother drowned them. That inspired Leach to investigate missing persons and John and Jane Doe's in hopes, she said, to give families closure so they know where their loved one is, so they're not sitting there for 40 years waiting on them to come home. Leach matched Gregory May's photo on a missing person's website to a clay reconstruction produced by Frank Bender. In those cases, Leach compares facial and physical features to find matches. Number 7, Susan Galbraith. This Mayfield, Kentucky homemaker couldn't let go of what she'd seen on August 1st, 2000. The image of 18-year-old Jessica Curran's burned and dumped body behind a local middle school stayed with her as year after year passed without a trace of Curran's terminator. But Galbraith didn't stop searching, even as the police investigator's trail ran cold after six years of probing the crime nearly every day, Strassman reported. Galbraith was convinced a man named Quincy Cross drove the car that picked up Curran along a road, and later assaulted and strangled her with his belt. Strassman reported Galbraith began asking so many questions. Galbraith said he started stalking her. I kept thinking, Cross had to be involved somehow, she said. In the course of six years of investigating, Galbraith reached out to everyone she could. She wrote letters to celebrities and even enlisted the help of a British journalist. But only when she started a MySpace tribute page to Curran did she get a lead. Galbraith opened the webpage to comments, and one day she got a hit. Victoria Caldwell, who attended the party with Curran, wrote to Galbraith saying she had information about Curran's passing. Needless to say, Galbraith said, the hairs on my back were beginning to stand up. Caldwell, an accomplice who helped dump Curran's body, was silent and scared for all those years. I was afraid, not only because I was afraid of the guy who actually committed the slaughter, but also of the police, Caldwell said. Galbraith put Caldwell in touch with Kentucky State investigators and she eventually confessed, leading to the arrests and conviction of four other accomplices and Cross, who was sentenced to life without parole. Caldwell served six months in prison for her role in the crime. It felt real good for me to be able to get that off my chest and to give the family the closure that they'd been looking for, Caldwell said. Galbraith was named Citizen of the Year by the Kentucky Bureau of Investigation for her involvement in solving the case. To know that I had just a slightest part in solving the crime, I just felt like I was meant to. Number 6, Sharon Derrick. Working with no DNA or dental x-rays and an unsolved mystery more than 30 years old, forensic scientists in Texas used the common freckle to help identify a 1980 hit and run victim as a woman who disappeared from Davison in 1979. People get freckles and freckles sometimes fade, but we were able to track three two on the left cheek and one near the right eye. In making the identification, said Dr. Sharon M. Derrick, a forensic anthropologist with the Harris County, Texas, Medical Examiner's Office. Harris County on Wednesday, January 29th, identified the Jane Doe accident victim as Jaster. This was one of those cases we really didn't have anything to go on. Derrick said of the case of Jaster, who passed away in a hit and run pedestrian accident in Houston on March 28th, 1980. Not only did the woman in the accident have no identification, her family and those who knew her were about 1,300 miles away, unaware of her whereabouts. Jaster was a former star basketball player at Davison High School, honor student and homecoming queen candidate, but she suffered from mental illness and vanished from her home at age 25. Her family never heard from her again. Siblings found out the reason for the silence after a citizen tip led Harris County officials to compare the unidentified woman with Jaster. Derek said identifications are typically made with fingerprints, but in this case, none were on file for Jaster. And although there were dental records to compare with autopsy reports, there were 
no dental x-rays to compare. Finally, investigators had DNA samples from Jasser's family members, but DNA wasn't collected for the accident victim when she was buried in Texas at county expense. Number 5. Payne Lindsay Payne Lindsay is an American director, documentary filmmaker, right side of the tree, lead singer, and podcast host. He is best known for co-creating and hosting the hit investigative journalist and true crime podcasts Up and Vanished and Atlanta Monster. Lindsay was born and raised in Kennesaw, Georgia. He obtained his first video camera at age 10 and later directed local television commercials and music videos. As a child, he wanted to direct feature films. Lindsay made a 13-minute documentary film about people that he had met on a cross-country road trip and entered it into festivals. He attended college on and off for a few years, but hated school. At age 23, his dad cut him off and he began focusing on creating and directing videos. In December 2015, Netflix released Making a Schmurderer. Lindsay watched the show and realized that he wanted to do something similar. With an early interest in investigative journalism, Lindsay was inspired to investigate the disappearance of beauty queen and school teacher Tara Grinstead, a well-known cold case in Georgia. At the time, Lindsay's intentions were to develop Grinstead's story into a documentary film, but he realized he did not have the funds to film interviews on location. Lindsay realized that he could produce a podcast at home and created Up and Vanished. Lindsay did not have access to police files, so instead scoured through old news articles and online forums to hunt out possible leads. Lindsay's grandmother lived in Tifton, Georgia, near Osceola, where Grinstead had gone missing. Lindsay broadcasts in real time, week by week, in audio form. Within a 12-month period, Period, the podcast received over 50 million downloads, which propelled Grinstead's case into the mainstream media. This helped uncover previously unnoticed evidence, which led to the decade-old case being cracked and two arrests made. Lindsay began podcasting full-time once Up and Vanished increased in popularity. Number 4. Billy Jensen In October 2006, Jensen was appointed director of new media at the Village Voice Media and helped the company transition from a weekly newspaper publisher into a multi-platform digital media company. Company. He introduced daily content and improved the company's website, SEO, and social media. He also improved the user interface for the website, which resulted in an increase in page views from 160 million to 710 million per year in four years, and also led to an increase in visitors from 2.7 to 16 million visitors per month. As the director, Jensen also developed and marketed several iPhone and Android mobile apps, such as Village Voice and LA Weekly, which subsequently earned a combined one. 1.5 million downloads within a period of 13 months from the date of their launch. He also helped develop the Best Of app, which was listed as one of 400 essential apps by Wired and Gizmodo in 2011, and one of the top five travel apps of 2011 by Apple. Jensen also led the creative development and launch of several national entertainment and true crime investigative sites, including toplessrobot.com, joystickdivision.com, and truecrimereport.com. He wrote large crime feature stories for LA Weekly, Boston Magazine, and The Washingtonian. His feature for Rolling Stone, Animal Instinct, How Cat Loving Sleuths Found an Accused Executioner Sadist, A Shocking Story of Citizen Detectives, A Videotaped Execution, Animal Torture, and One Very Disturbed Celebrity Wannabe was published in March of 2014 and provided much of the basis for the Netflix crime series Don't F with Cats. Basically, this guy is really accomplished. In July 2015, Jensen joined America's first daytime syndicated crime show, Warner Brothers' Crime Watch Daily, as the show's senior producer and investigator. He was in charge of the digital face of the show and focused on the website and YouTube channels, which grew into one of the biggest crime YouTube channels in the world, behind us of course. After a 17-year career of writing crime stories and reporting missing persons, Jensen decided to solve unsolved execution mysteries and find missing persons by himself. By utilizing social media investigative techniques, Jensen has helped solve 10 cases. Number 3. Michelle McNamara Perhaps one of the biggest citizen sleuth stories from the past few years is that of author Michelle McNamara, who wrote her bestseller, I'll Be Gone in the Dark, chronicling her relentless search for the Golden State Butcher. Sadly, McNamara passed away in her sleep before she could finish her book and before the executioner's identity was finally found. But it's clear that she was hot on his trail and even predicted that the butcher had been a policeman at some point. Detective Paul Holes uploaded the perpetrator's DNA to GED Match and 
found familial connections that they then narrowed down. Joseph James D'Angelo was arrested in April of 2018 and was charged with 12 counts of first degree execution. D'Angelo was sentenced to multiple life sentences and blamed the executions on an alternate personality named Jerry. It's always amazing to read about armchair detectives who spend their free time and talents digging deep into cold cases that has touched them in some way. Number two, Margaret Davis. One warm July afternoon, Margaret Davis was taking a nap on the sofa at her home in the small town of Bingham, Nottinghamshire, when the phone woke her. Half in a daze, she answered and a voice simply said, Steve's had an accident. He's gone, Margaret, and the line went cold. Stephen was her 32-year-old son who lived in the Philippines. Margaret Davis was stunned. Inside, I was screaming, the 55-year-old former social worker remembers, but no sound came out of my mouth. My baby, my son. No, it can't be. I spoke to him only yesterday, how could this be? She buried her face in a cushion and sat motionless for over an hour. I felt as if I was waiting, powerless to move, for a train to run me over. But Margaret Davis's tragedy had only just begun. There was far worse to come. For when she raised herself from the sofa to take a second call, giving her some of the details of what had happened, she discovered that Stephen had been ended, shot by three gunmen in the middle of the night at his home in the city of Makita in the Philippines. But as Margaret learned more about her son's marriage, the suspicions that her daughter-in-law knew much more about the ending that she was prepared to admit steadily grew. It was two days after that fateful telephone call that Margaret Davis actually met her strikingly beautiful brown-eyed daughter-in-law for the first time. But rather than commiserating with the woman who had just lost her son, Stephen's widow immediately asked Asked her for money. As the days passed, Margaret heard from friends of the couple that Evelyn often entertained many male friends at the couple's home in Angeles, while her husband was away during the week working in Makatai. Incense, and just hours before her son's funeral, Margaret Davis confided her suspicions about Evelyn to the police. She told them Evelyn had been stealing money from her son, that the gunman had used a key to get into the house, that no one could contact Evelyn in the hours of his passing, that she'd never called even after his execution and that Evelyn said the gunman had been in the house for 20 minutes, when there was no way she could have known that fact. Evelyn was later arrested and so were the gunmen. Number one, Yakov German. Yakov German isn't a cop or a private detective. He's a property manager and father of 12 with a reputation as a do-gooder. By banging on doors and scrutinizing granny video, he uncovered crucial clues that led cops to confessed slaughterer Levi Aaron. At the end of the day, he should be given the credit for the cracking of the case, said Rabbi Jack Meyer of the NYPD's clergy liaison program. His investigation into the disappearance of the boy was unofficial, but personal. German, 47, lives on 45th Street in Borough Park. Leiby vanished Monday after leaving a yeshiva day camp one block away on 44th Street, but the connection wasn't just geographic. I found out my son was his teacher and I was even more motivated, German said. He heard Leiby was missing late Monday and a few hours later, with the help of son Avrumi, 25, and the principal of yeshiva Boyan, he had access to school security video. The cameras captured Leiby leaving the lunchroom with a shopping bag over his shoulder and a knapsack on his bag. Because local businesses were closed, German German couldn't track him outside, so he spent the wee hours with neighbors shouting for Leiby on 13th Avenue. Searchers assumed Leiby turned in that direction because he was supposed to meet with his parents on 13th Avenue and 50th Street on the first day he was allowed to walk home alone. I had a feeling I was going to bring him back alive, German said. I told my son, go to sleep. Tomorrow morning, I'll have him alive. Thanks for watching. Leave a like and comment if you enjoyed this video, and we'll see you next time. Unkind. Go solve some crimes.